wonder what makes the greats great what makes the successful successful what makes the brilliant brilliant our tuesday meetups with the celebrities of pharma industry and science are your one stop shop to all these answers and more join us for pies of life an initiative of the biopatrika industry mentorship program where we bring your dream mentors to you Hi, I'm Mukta Joshi. I'm originally from Mumbai. I grew up, I was born and brought up in Mumbai. And then um, in 2000, I came to the US to do my PhD in economics. Um, I have, uh, as my research topic, I uh, studied financial access for hawkers in Mumbai. And um, I always wanted to do something applied. So uh, ever since I started, started doing my phd my dream was to come to india do some uh, research work in in india and uh, learn about more about our country and problems and what we could uh, do to improve uh, them so after that i i finished my phd in 2005 and after then after between 2006 and 2011 i worked with the world bank in washington dc Uh, and i was working mainly on financial access for small and medium enterprises uh, particularly in south asian countries uh, bangladesh pakistan and india and then 2011 2012 i took a break i had two kids one after the other and then i with 2015 i joined ideas 42 which is a behavioral science uh, nonprofit based out of new york city which i will tell you a little more about so so that is uh, my background i um, perfect so now let's okay what we are going to do is you are going to look at the shape on the screen and tell me the color of the shape okay that's a game that we are starting with is the is is it clear maybe you could unmute yourselves right yeah so the task is you will shape see different shapes all you have to do is the tell me the color of the shapes should we start yes yeah. sorry yeah yeah be fast i'm going okay. to move fast gray okay gray gray green 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 Orange, 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 red, red, red. 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 Oh, you all red. are impressive. <laughs> <laughs> you don't. You have. You you have. You already are using your system to thinking. So let me tell you about this. Have you all? Has any one of the you played this game before? Yes. yes. Some have. Some <laughs> of you have. So it's a classic. test called stoop test so what it does typically is that when you are told to look at the shape and say its color you 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 do that but when you re, when you are shown a word our brain automatically reads the color uh, reads the word instead of telling the color and that in behavioral science we call system one thinking so what system one thinking does is that it tells you like it helps you in it it's automated thinking that helps you in making quick decisions so beginning after as soon as we wake up and until we go to sleep in our daily life we there are so many decisions that we have to take and that system one thinking which is really automatic thinking allows us to take these millions of decisions that we have to take routinely right but and most of the and then system 2 thinking is basically logical which requires more thorough processing uh, to complete the task so if we have to if we are given a mathematical problem for example we are going to need a uh, need system 2 thinking versus system 1 right so um, so what behavioral science teaches us about are these mental shortcuts and in what situations they may at, they may be at play and at ideas 42 where i work uh, we use our understanding of the behavioral science to understand to identify when mental shortcuts might be contributing to a problem and design solutions that address them so let's learn a little bit about ideas 42 so ideas 42 is a behavioral uh, science nonprofit it's a nonprofit consulting um uh 
organization based out of New York City. What we do is we use insights from behavioral science to design solutions to some of the world's most persistent social problems. So in the past two or three decades, the uh, behavioral science has really taken off. And behavioral science is actually the uh, integration of psychology, uh, neuroscience, and behavioral economics. Um, we work in, uh, at, at, as of now, we have worked in over 40 countries and we work with a range of partners, businesses, governments, foundations, and nonprofits. So uh, we were founded by uh, Sendil Mulainathan, who is a professor now at actually University of Chicago, but he was at uh, Harvard then. Then Antoinette Shore, who is a professor at MIT, yeah. and El Eldar Shafir, who is a a psychology professor at Princeton. And uh, what they found in around 2008 was that their exciting um, academic research findings, they were looking to apply them in the real world. And that's when they uh, actually dreamed up Ideas 42, which started as a, a small lab research lab in Harvard. And then now uh, after a decade or so, we are a, we are a non registered nonprofit in the US working on solving social problems, applying behavioral science in over 40 countries. So now let's, let's talk about this. I, I really want to introduce you to behavioral science, at least to those who are not familiar with. When you look at this slide, uh, you might be intrigued, right? What, because it's a little bit uh, ironic. You see that these people that you see um, on the escalator, you would, you would imagine that they want to exercise. But then instead of taking the stairs, they are actually taking the um, e escalator, right? So, so what this slide highlights is that people are inconsistent. But it also highlights that there is uh, there is a context that helps them in making this uh, decision about using an escalator versus the staircase. And that context is having the escalator next to the staircase, right? So, so when we are thinking about behavioral science, what we think about doing is um, thinking about why people are making particular, taking actions, uh, particular decisions and actions, and really understanding how we can help them understand their behaviors in a way that will help them, help us help them make uh, decisions or take actions that they themselves want to take for themselves. So, so that that is what behavioral science um, is all about. And now, uh, so I just told you that the context shapes our decisions and actions. So, just as a uh, the next step, I want to show you how changing the context actually makes impact. And here I want to share with you the next slide. And I think you won't be able to hear me. So let me stop share and then reshare it so that you can hear this particular video when it plays. Okay, now I'm playing a video and there is some background noise from someone. So if they could mute themselves, that might help. So you see what happened here, right? Uh, you, 
when they replaced the regular staircase with a piano based staircase the noise that that or the music that was generated actually help people to take the staircase versus the escalator so it was that, that is what i ch say a change in context right and so uh, by uh, this is an example of how in fun way you could uh, also help people make decisions that that are many times in their interest so if uh, most of the people if you had interviewed them about whether they should have taken the staircase versus escalator they would have said oh yes i want uh, i should have taken the staircase but you know the escalator was just there and i decided to go for it so so this is what i wanted to highlight with that video now let me talk about behavioral design in practice so how how do we actually go about uh, changing context and helping pe people make decisions that they want. So at Ideas42, we do it through a me method that we call the diagnosis method. So what we do is that we start by defining a problem that we are trying to solve. And then this problem is defined in terms of a behavior. After we define the problem, we deep dive into the context. We try to understand, we observe people, we interview these uh, people for whom we are designing a solution uh, and try to understand what are the behavioral barriers that may be driving this behavior that we have defined in the, prob in the, in the problem definition phase. Once we know what behavioral bottlenecks are contributing to this problem, we design to directly address those bottlenecks. Then what we design, we try to test it as much as possible through a randomized control trial. And given that you are in the field of biotechnology, you would be familiar with it. So we use uh, RCTs uh, to test the solutions that we are, we are generating. And our, always we look for scaling the successes that we have had. And this process, although it might look linear, it's actually very iterative. So, I, so this is the process that we use to uh, generate uh, ideas and um, solve problems using behavioral science. Uh, let me stop here before I give you an example of the work that I actually have done so far. Any questions or you want me to continue? Okay, great. So let me start with the micro. I'm going to talk about financial heuristics, a project that did, I did in India, in fact, in Bangalore and in, uh, in the Philippines. So micro entrepreneurs make mistakes in managing their businesses, right? So universally, we find that managing a business is difficult. People who work, particularly in the global, global South, these uh, people who run extremely small businesses are all like very low educated. They they work in low resource environment. They work in resources of they work in the context of scarcity. And by scarcity, we mean scarcity of time as well as money. So if you have scarce resource, there is it, it impacts uh, decision making. So these people are the ones that are working in the context of scarcity, and they also have to make complex financial and business decisions. And they have to do all this with lack of skills or support to manage uh, business and finances. So what is the solution so far? The solution is, OK, to address this problem by of, uh, by developing skills or support by offering business training through entrepreneurs. And then traditional business trainings ha are offered to entrepreneurs where they are brought in uh, a classroom-based setting to educate them about financial and business management topics like accounting, business planning. And although millions of dollars have been spent on these programs annually, such programs have had very limited impact on changing behaviors, right? So why that is the case? Because the traditional program actually assumes that uh, micro entrepreneurs make mistake in business management because they do not have the knowledge, right? About, of how to, man, uh, how to manage a business. So what is the solution? They offer these programs and just provide a lot of information and knowledge. And then they expect that whatever knowledge is shared, these people apply it uh, once they 
come out of the classroom uh, on themselves by themselves right uh, but behaviorally what why we found is that uh, our behavioral diagnosis in fact highlighted that although micro entrepreneurs may have the intention to apply what is taught in training contextual features like complexity of material for example makes it really hard to translate their intentions into actions people have limited cognitive processing ability meaning they meaning synthesizing classroom knowledge into real world behavior may be really difficult to do or it could be done incorrectly and then conditions of scarcity can further exacerbate the these conditions so when people feel trapped for time or money their attention gets narrowed and they they systematically neglect certain decisions and consequences so these insights led our one of our co-founders antonet shore and her team of researchers to look for alternative ways to teach to teach business business management to entrepreneurs and that led to the birth of financial heuristics or rules of thumb for financial management so based on their prolonged research and observations of micro entrepreneurs in the dominican republic they found that knowledge alone is not often complex and difficult to translate into actions on the other hand distilling information into simple applicable rules of thumb actually can lower the barriers to adoption and improve behaviors even in the context of complete lack of understanding of accounting or business planning and that's that's so 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 this that's how financial heuristics were developed so instead of teaching micro entrepreneurs double ledger accounting you tell teach them use two separate locations for your business and household cash pay yourself a fixed weekly salary if you borrow from the business location for household pay, paid back only give to credit credit to customers if prior credit is paid off so all these are really uh, simple rules of thumb backed in theory but all what the entrepreneur gets is the simple rules that are very very easy to remember and apply so once we developed this training we offered this uh, training in a classroom based setting in the dominican republic and we found that those who received this financial heuristics based training versus accounting based training actually perform better not only in terms of improving business practices but, but also in terms of generating more sales so 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 we know that our curriculum worked but then the problem we faced when we started thinking about scale is that even classroom based uh, training although simple is hard to scale because think about micro entrepreneurs who have to leave their businesses families and come and attend multiple long sessions uh, to get this uh, uh, training uh, from the perspective of financial institution which typically offers such trainings they have to do a lot of coordination logistics right so so we thought about using a different delivery channel and for this iteration we decided to go for a, a mobile phones because uh, because these people also work in low resource con context and they are not as educated something sending something on the phone as text messages wouldn't have worked so we decided to go with ivr interactive voice response technology and started sending messages to to the entrepreneurs over their mobile phones and uh, our diagnosis phase confirmed that the problems that these micro entrepreneurs were facing were uh, and as i said these are uh, these are the micro entrepreneurs in india and the philippines they were very similar to what we had observed in the uh, in the in the dominican republic so our actually the main uh, goal for this training was to make sure that our content is engaging so we worked with the marketing firm in india and then and the and the philippines and made these um, uh, audio messages very very engaging so we had a virtual um, micro entrepreneur who based on her 15 years of business was sharing tips and tricks uh, about business management with uh, with a uh, with uh, micro entrepreneurs uh, over the phone uh, at the time that they wanted to get these messages and each message was about 3 to 4 minute long and we sent this training on a weekly basis for about 6 months and uh, what we found that uh, we also sent the content in a soap opera style so people were very interested to hear up hear it versus just getting it in uh, in terms of instructional messages that could 
sound very dry and almost boring. So what we found was that people really engaged well with our content over uh, approximately 75% people in the Philippines and India actually picked up the call. There was high listenership. And we also found that they, this uh, engagement with content con translated into change in business practices. And what we found is that in the Philippines, our microfinance institution with whom we work to offer this training to its clients actually uh, uh, offered this training to more clients. And now we are um, really scaling this training in Africa, currently in Ethiopia, for example. So this is the work that I did as, as soon as I joined IDS42. Now I work in mostly in Africa. Uh, currently I work on projects where there are a lot of cash transfer programs um, that, that basically help, pe um, uh, help people come out of poverty. So in the past two decades or so, cash transfer programs have been one of the most um, powerful toolkit uh, to address poverty. And what it, me what it entails is actually giving cash to more direct cash to vulnerable people people. And what we do at IDS42 is that we typically partner with the World Bank and governments in Sub-Saharan Africa. So when who are offering these uh, cash transfer programs to their beneficiaries. And what we do is that we add behavioral interventions or what we also call nudges to these programs. So we uh, so that the, the cash doesn't only get spent on consumption, but it also helps a people to improve their livelihoods. So we help people make uh, make uh, uh, plan making exercise uh, to, for example, invest uh, their cash in productive inclusion activities like a business or learning a new skill, for example. So one what I, I at Naren Kaka's request, I'm adding a few pictures. This is first picture is from Philippines where I'm talking to a beneficiary while doing the diagnosis work. And the other picture is from Ethiopia where uh, I'm again talking to beneficiaries to understand uh, their context, asking them questions. And then actually they are doing an activity we have developed to as a solution to one of the problems. And um, one of the best part of my job is that I get to travel a lot and sometimes I also get to bring my family and kids uh, with me. So uh, I think in 2019, I took my children to Ethiopia with me and I had taken my nanny also. So she was looking after them and I was working, but I wanted to give them that exposure and these are my children. So they they definitely got, uh, my, my daughter made her hair Afro. They are wearing its traditional Ethiopian clothes here then they got to uh, they got to play with ethiopian kids got to interact with a lot of people uh, we took vacation and uh, ate a lot of good food so on that note i will end here and then take your questions or talk to you more about but um yeah i thought this is because this is a emerging field and i I'm pretty confident not many people are unfortunately using it. I wanted to introduce you to the field of behavioral science. And I, I really think that when you work, most of us work for people, right? Whatever we are developing, we are. I, it's, it could be a program, it could be a product, or it could be a service. We, we develop it for the people. And people's behavior is quirky. Uh, it it is inconsistent, but um, and not predictable. But it is in. But but it actually there are lessons that have now emerged from behavioral science that we could apply. And and when we use these insights, what we are able to do is design more effectively than otherwise. So there are many instances where programs are just developed and what we what is assumed is that because once the program is out there people will just take it up but that is not the case there are so many pre programs even in the us that go underutilized because th there are for example lot of hassle factors so so for example here low income population can get financial aid to go to college but many people actually do not avail that benefit because it's it's such a hassle to fill out the forms so in one intervention we help pre-populate the fields. And when we did that, the results were much 
stronger to uh, uh, many people completed the application because it, it helped them um, reduce those hassle factors. So just to give you more examples from, from what, I, what I mean. So I, that's what I wanted to say. And if I would love to uh, now open it uh, for discussion and specific questions, or if uh, you would like to know anything more, feel free to ask. Yeah, Narinka, you are. No, just raising your hand. Yeah. I think I'll ask Reshma to ask the first question this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was very interesting to hear uh, about how the behavioral science uh, is being applied uh, to the real world and how the how they are helped financially. So uh, my question would be like, uh, uh, how did this idea emerge that this behavioral science, behavior of the people can be understood to overcome their problems, their daily life problems, how to how this idea has emerged and how this idea 42 came in. Yeah, no, that's a very good question. So um, I, I, I don't know how much familiar you are with the field of economics, right? So in economics, uh, I will tell you that we are all considered as icons. So humans are considered as icons. By icons, we mean that we are we are considered as rational decision makers. So when we are posed with a decision, we economics assumes that we weigh all costs and benefits. And if benefits are higher than costs, we make the, go, make the decision in favor. If not, we don't, right? But that is not how we live our life. So traditional, really theoretical economics assumes this, but what behavioral economics does is that people have preferences. People might behave inconsistently. People, even when benefits are more than cost, people may not do something. And why do they not do something when that, that they should have done it based on the principles of economics? It's because of their behavior. So I gave you an example, right? Where uh, you saw that these kids who are from low income households, they are offered benefits such as financial aid. If they were rational cons, they would do costs and benefits analysis. Benefits of going to college are going to definitely outweigh costs. They will go for it. That, that is not what we observe. What we observe was that they just give up. Why do they give up? Because of the hassle factors. The forms are really, really long. So their current costs are so high that they don't think about their future. And that is called present bias so they so 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 what we do is that from we have to think about how people like follow a process how do they what are the steps in the process that people have to take to do something that we want them to do right and then for each step of this process we we think about what if there are from a behavioral perspective what could be the bottlenecks and then we design so that it helps them navigate through the process more successfully than just putting it out there and leaving it on their own, right? So that's how um, that's how the principle, the field of behavioral economics emerged. And uh, I think about two in two twenty eighteen, I, I, I imagine, yeah, I think um, uh, Professor Richard Taylor, who is called the father of behavioral economics, got the Nobel Prize, and he has written one of the most famous books called Nudge. So uh, uh, that is about small behavioral interventions. And if you all get a chance, I would really encourage you to read it because it's, it, it gives very, very simple examples of how changing context can have big impacts that uh, at low cost. So that is one thing. And then ideas 42, uh, uh, that question, uh, good, good that ask, uh, you asked, many people ask this question. So this is a very nerdy uh, company. So as I said, we, we started as a, uh, as a research lab at, ID, uh, at Harvard. And um, so the reason we are, uh, how many of you have read or are familiar with Hitchhiker's Guide to Galaxy book? There uh, you, you are. Okay, so there uh, a supercomputer is asked this question: What is the meaning of life? And that person, uh, that computer, thinks, 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 and after a lot of time, comes up with the answer: forty-two. 
right and then when that computer is asked why did you say the answer is 42 it says in order to get the right answer you have to ask the right questions so that is what 42 represents it's very very nerdy but we believe that in order to get the right solution you have to really really ask the right question and that's why in our methodology defining a problem defining the problem is one of the most critical steps we don't want to so sometimes when we work with partners they come up with a problem but then when we work closely we realize that is not the problem the, the problem is something else right so that's that's what we want to make sure that we work on a problem that is the problem versus that what is not yeah Let's let's go to Chai because I don't know I don't know why the guys never call into these meetings right I don't know Akshay go ahead <laughs> kudos to you <laughs> um so I, I was wondering what is it like working for an NGO versus a corporate is it is it a much more interesting environment are you allowed to um, practice things without you know that um, that you know end goal being a very important factor i've never worked for a corporate job, corporate right? job right. so i actually when i was really like uh, in 20 i think 2013 or something i really uh, i was in boston and it's really hard to get like you know new york or dc in the us at least you get a lot of jobs in multi like international organizations or not profit not much in boston so i actually worked for a, a, a corporate job for a 9 months or something and i was not ready for it but my friend worked there my husband said you how can you say that you like for non profit work when you have you don't know the counterpart and that counterpart is actually for profit work so i said okay let me be open and do that job and i i really felt that i am not meant to do such jobs it was a market research company and because my background is in economics i i it's not something economics is applied to many many fields right so it's quite quite uh, 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 like trans tra as an economist your skills are quite transferable but i really realize that what drives me is actually making that impact so um, and i'm sure people at in the private sector make that impact but my educational background is also in the field of international development so like what i have learned i i really that i just when i think about myself i think that if i spend so much time in learning something uh, i i really don't think i'm an expert in other things so i just focus on what i know the best and try to apply what i know uh, to the prob problems um, that might find my skill set valuable so 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 that's that's why i have always worked in this uh, in this field and as for working at ideas 42 it's really not a typical ngo so so um and i could be a you like again i am a behavioral scientist now so i'm thinking about behavioral biases so i might be stereotyping right now when i say that usually um uh, standards are a little lower when you consider nonprofits, but that is really not ca the case where I work. So my where I work, is, um, I really get an opportunity to work with very very sharp and smart minds. Um, as you could see uh, on our board, you will see people who have who are mo Nobel laureates, right? So Daniel Kahneman, who got the Nobel Prize in Economics for uh, uh, for ex for example, for his work in psychology and loss aversion, so or Richard Taylor. So so I really get to work with really really smart people, a lot of academic academicians. So um, and then um, so I also get to work on problems that that are important in my uh, perspective. And one of the best parts about working at ideas 42 versus the world bank is that i when i work with the world bank we created we did a lot of research like i did a lot of research came up with a lot of reports and i don't know what happened to those reports i don't i can't guarantee you that those reports were read by the governments and policy changed because of those right but when i developed something at ideas 42 because we 
care so much for testing. So in the, in the example of financial heuristics, we put this together this curriculum and we tested it through randomized control trials. So I can see, okay, what we designed, does it really make an impact in the real world? And if it does, I also have the opportunity to actually scale it to more people. So, so I think all these factors really uh, make me stay in the field that I have chosen. Okay. Raji, you see, raise your hand. Yes. Uh, hello, ma'am. Uh, this is Rajeshri Kadam. I'm currently doing my PhD from Tata Memorial Center. So actually, I have two things to ask. In your talk, you are talking about micro entrepreneur, where you're actually helping small business uh, people to expand their business further and helping them out on that. So how does micro entrepreneurs differ from a terminology called normal entrepreneurs, where people with new ideas which may have some good impact, uh, like in, in terms of like uh, socio-economical benefit or maybe in, uh, benefits in agriculture. So do you help such entrepreneurs also with some novel ideas? Can such people approach uh, this uh, idea for you or do you help only people with uh, some basic or uh, uh, established uh, kind of business setup? So this is my first question. And second question is, does this idea of uh, cash transfer program really work in countries like India, where people are not so, uh, like, I, I mean, they're not so good with education and there are so many problems, uh, socio-economical problems. And especially I'm talking in terms of tribal uh, areas in India where there is scarcity of such basic resources uh, so what is your opinion about this idea? Okay, so let me answer your first question. So Idea Spotty 2 basically works um, through funding by uh, various foundations uh, or, or bilateral government funding or multinational. So you, we get, so, so the thing is when we work on something, typically it is through a project that we have received funding for. So when we develop training curriculum from my, for financial heuristics project that I shared about, with you about, that is where we uh, actually uh, had developed that project when we had received for, uh, funding for that by from the World Bank and from the US government. So, so we, uh, we do not work with individual entrepreneurs. We also, we basically work with end users as part of the project that we specifically work on so that that said uh for for the population that you just mentioned we should we wouldn't be able to help but i can definitely share some resources so if you are talking about somebody who is very interested in a business idea and trying to build his or her own business and they are pretty educated and they have access to the internet. There are a lot of relatively, uh, in fact, some of them very like free resources that I can share you, share share with you. So one is by with the, from the World Bank, another one is from ILO. So so that's that's what I uh, I can share on that. With regards to cash transfers, cash transfers have shown actually to work better than any in-kind assistance offered to people anywhere. So typically the, in the field of international development, uh, the idea was that when you give people things in kind, uh, you are making sure that they don't waste the money you give, right? So you are giving people something in kind as, as aid. But as more and more research started uh, happening what they found was that many times what you offer in kind may not be what people really need right and there is also a strong assumption in that approach that people are going to be bad decision makers when you give them cash and when more field studies on this topic emerge what they found was that that is not the case when you people give when you give people cash, for example, yes, you might say think that oh, people might start drinking more, for example, because now they got cash. But the increase in alcohol consumption was not significantly different from people 
who were doing it be before receiving the cash. So it did not, that is like, of course there will be such people, but they are not as many or they don't increase in proportion just because you give them the cash. So this cash transfer actually started in Latin America, particularly in Mexico. And the program was so successful that now in many parts of the world, particularly in Africa, there is a field like this, this uh, concept of cash transfers has taken place and it really, really has proven impact. Uh, and sometimes, so there are two types of cash transfers, conditional cash transfer and unconditional cash transfer. So unconditional is you just give people cash and they, they will just use it for, for example, consumption, right? The conditional cash transfer program is basically if you send people, uh, your kids to school, then you, then only you get uh, the cash, right? So it is tied to an other outcome that the government or the funder is very interested in and what behavioral science has shown so firstly unconditional trash transfers are very easy to implement because you don't need to check right there is no administrative burden because you are just giving people once you decide who is your eligible people you just hand out the cash but if you go for conditional cash transfer there is a lot of administrative things that you have to do, right? So you have to check, for example, oh, you uh, has this person, how many days did he or she send her kids to school, for example, et cetera. All these things have to be uh, done. So uh, here also in this field, so conditional cash transfers have proven to be very expensive. So what, what behavioral scientists did was that they took out the conditional part in one study, I think it was in Malawi or Zambia, again in Sub-Saharan Africa, what they did was that they distributed the cash in a school setting, but they did not put condition that you have to send your kids to school. So it was an unconditional cash transfer program, but the venue was school setting. So what it basically did was that it showed the significance of school to those who were coming to get the cash. And those people who 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 came to school and took their cash actually started sending their kids more to school so you have now really taken away extra burden but nudged people by think just changing the context so instead of asking them to come to a program office right district office to collect cash you ask them to come to school so basically you said schools are important they and then you could put potentially also put some um visual clues like posters about kids going to school, et cetera. So, so this is how also behavioral science could be powerful in helping people make choices that are going to help them in their future. As for India, I think uh, India's cash transfer programs um, are, uh, they are not as strongly implemented as in, uh, in actually uh, in, uh, Latin America or Sub-Saharan Africa, but having said that, actually India has the biggest cash transfer program in the world, which was related to that um, LPG gas subsidy. So, so that is a program which is actually people get subsidy for using that LPG uh, cylinder or something like that. So, so um, I I just feel that. Uh, the questions that you asked, uh, Rajeshri, very these are very uh, important questions. Anybody who is thinking about cash transfers are going to ask these questions. But this, even in the context of Indian people, finally we are all human. Uh, I am pretty certain, based on what we have found, that cash transfers would work better than in in kind transfer. Uh, yes, so I'll, I'd like to ask, ma'am. So I'm Rai Kamal. I'm currently doing my uh, postdoctoral uh, research in neuroscience. So maybe I missed the first part, but what made you uh, get interested in behavioral science? As in, uh, do, did you ever have a biology background? Or as in, you're the first person I'm seeing who had an economic background, but then connected that to behavioral science. So, yeah, behavioral science doesn't require knowledge of biology. 
right behavioral science yeah. is the field that talks about like that integrates the field of psychology neuroscience and then economics so i'm like those who might be working in it from neuroscience perspective Yes. may have biological uh, uh like background or but right. if you are a psychologist or economist you need not have it right yes. so yes. i i would say that uh i i i must say that i was not particularly interested in behavioral science before i joined ideas 42 yes. so i was looking for a job i wanted to make sure that i i work in the non profit sector i continue to make impact and then i found this position which required like background in financial access and mm. working working um uh work experience in developing countries which i yes. had because i uh, because of my academic background and then i worked with the world bank right and mm. then when i started working at ideas 42 we wanted to scale financial heuristics and mm. they had done one trial with audio phones uh, in india that had failed so they were looking for somebody to just scale it because they thought that our trial is going to work but actually it mm. failed so that brought me into behavioral science because then because the trial failed we started redeveloping the content which i would have not had opportunity had we not you know failed because if you if you don't fail you would just use what you have mm. oh, yes. so that's how i got interested in like behavioral science but before mm. that when i was around 2006 i used to actually work with a uh, a uh, 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 professor carla hoff who is actually an economist development economist who works in the world bank and also teaches in uh, colombia and princeton and i worked with her and we worked actually in uttar pradesh so we would go there uh, in villages and yeah. learn about um, decision making and uh, in the context of caste system so that was my introduction to behavioral science but uh, but mm. but but uh, so although i had introduction to it i never applied it but then mm. luckily i got interest like i got this job and then um, i think uh, there are that's how i actually uh, learned about it so when uh, like when you are designing a strategy it is mainly based on a community or a certain section of people right so when you go for the field work uh, how significant are the uh, interpersonal differences amongst a community or do you take into account the personal differences from one person to the other yeah that's a good question we don't you usually we don't uh, we don't design for one person right yes. but we design for the context we are in so if yes. i am talking about let's say a woreda in ethiopia many times very similar people live there yes. Yes. right so yes. what we do is that uh, let's say we are talking about we are working with cash transfer program recipients so yes. to some extent they are very similar to each other right they they live in a particular yes. area yes. they have a low education background mm. they work mm. in really really resource constrained environment they are from mm. the same community for example mm. and what we do is that when we go in the field we talk to them mm. we lot I ask a lot of qualitative questions we really try to understand their context observe how they behave uh, how they make decisions take actions and make Uh, uh and design the solutions which typically work for the particular community mm. that we have designed it in and then of course we used randomized controlled trial to make sure yes. they mm. are uh, they are uh, real um, uh, uh, helpful right so so that is one way to go about it so now once what i have applied in like what i have developed in ethiopia would mm. it be actually relevant for mm. south africa Mm-hmm. that is a question that mm-hmm. is uh, i cannot answer that usually yeah. highly likely the case yeah. but yeah. we still have to go in that context talk to people there confirm that the problems they face are similar if i want to use the solution i have developed and if i see that it is actually sim- the problems are similar still whatever my solution is i will have to to some extent modify it to make sure it is applicable to their context because context right. differs correct yes yes who is talking i 
Aparajita? Aparajita, you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi, Mukta. Yeah. Aparajita here. Uh, I'm an experienced biotech professional. So, as you already said that, you know, conditional versus unconditional money flow. So, I think it has more, uh, you know, uh, behavioral, uh, what's the edge over uh, the economics part, what what you think about it, like, you know, uh, easy cash flow uh, can can be more beneficial or as most of the economists say that if, say, you, if you are distributing something which is free of cost, it is not always like, you know, prefer uh, people go and prefer that. So uh, I think that uh, that is the same thought uh, which you also echo uh, here in your case. So uh, what it will lead actually, it will lead to an open economy or a closed economy basically. So uh, where we are leading uh, to it in case of economics basically. I don't think I'm qualified to answer what you are saying because uh, I think what you're asking is very at a very macro level. But what I could say is that there, I, uh, there was a recent study that was made that was done in Canada with homeless people in uh, uh, with homeless people and what it involved was giving people cash directly and they gave 7500 to homeless people and then they tracked the outcomes and their behaviors over a year and what they found was that many people who got this cash actually moved out of the streets and rented a place, right? They started eating better. Uh, yeah. They started feeding their kids better. And the net benefit actually was positive because for the, each homeless person, uh, government spends on shelters, for example. So now, and then, uh, and, and other facilities, and it, the, the cost per person was $8,000 versus you just gave $7,500 to these people, right? So the outcome was was positive. So so when you are thinking about generally, um, um, like I, I probably, I'm not even sure I understood your question, but I'm just trying to apply this yeah. micro context to macro con context. And what I'm, I'm uh, what I will say is that there is this, um, you always think about capitalism versus uh, um, mixed economy or socialism, right? So, so there is this concept of universal basic in, income that is emerging. So you mm. make sure everybody in the society is assured of the basic minimum. And what it shows is that um, th that those people who had nothing, if you give something to them, actually what happens is that you show them if you have money, how they can improve their life. So mm. instead of like giving cash to people doesn't make them lazy, but they, it shows them how uh, they can improve their lives and they actually start working more okay. than they, they have. Right. So, so that have, so if, if that is what, and then because you are giving them cash, uh, you are also taking economies money from other services that you are, that are catered for these people. So, mm -hmm. so, so as I, that's why I gave you an example from of the Canada study. So I think giving people cash to help them like do better in life and survive yeah. actually has more positive impact than um, uh, than otherwise. Yeah, thank you, thanks. Maybe we'll take two, two, uh, two more questions. Uh, I'd like to ask one question. It is again uh, with this direct or uh, cash transfers. So uh, don't you think instead of giving them the cash directly, if this money is given to them as a loan, it will make them more responsible and should be a long-term solution rather than a direct cash transfer? So if, if you give loan, what are you expected to do with it? Right? Uh, Just... Okay, so if... Uh, as you mentioned about the conditional cash transfer, if your child is going to the school that uh, the parents will receive the money, the direct cash transfer. So after a few years, that money, the parents or the child will have to repay the money to the uh, NGO. So I think it will make them more uh, responsible or they'll continue basically going to the school. 
so when you make a loan first of all you need to make sure people have repayment capacity why would somebody give them a loan if you are not even sure people are able to repay right here you are talking about people who cannot even eat enough right so if you give loan to them you are not sure about their repayment capacity these are not the people these are not micro entrepreneurs these are the people who are trying to make a living so these are really really poor people so some of them might have a a, a business and a loan could be helpful but they are not yet at that level so some so so that's why subsistence cash transfer is a program that is uh, offered to many of such people but but then there is again some there are some programs that, that actually help people start a business for example and that's one of the programs i'm working with in ethiopia but there is no uh, loan given because it's a more for such people giving a loan is more like a burden because okay. you are telling them to return it when they don't even know whether uh, how to go about it right but in in one of the cash transfer programs in ethiopia they are they they give people cash for work so they work they get cash and as part of this program which is for 3 years they also get 500 dollars to start their business so that is a grant and then the program offers lot of trainings and skill development activities so that they these people are able to start their own livelihood before they graduate from the program but but in the context of people we are talking about loan wouldn't at least based on what i know loan wouldn't be a good idea because it it comes with lot of conditions that they still have to meet फेसिंग दिस Uh, financial losses or you know their business is not working properly so how do you identify these problems in different countries and then you know design new solutions that's a very very good question trupti <laughs> so so i think uh, what we um, uh, is she here oh <laughs> I, my screen changed so i couldn't see you okay so the thing is that what we the typically we, the, the way we work is we work ha, so you basically has you have asked how do we scope our projects right so that happens in multiple ways uh, one way is basically to uh, we we respond to different rfps by different organizations right so they have identified problems we think that it they the problem is behavioral and it can solve uh the issue we 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 apply for them then in the case of micro entrepreneurs we already had our uh, academician who was doing research on the topic and that's where they realized about the behavioral challenges that these micro entrepreneurs faced right so once that that became clear then we we realized that okay the problems that so far have been focused on are not behavioral na in nature but we think that this could be a problem that is behavioral in nature and we could address then we come up with concept notes and proposals connect and then talk to different funders and if they have interest we uh, uh, they they fund us so that's how we go about it sometimes now that we are in the field for over a decade uh, partners or funders just come and say that we think this is a problem and we think there could be some behavioral bottlenecks going on so we we again connect with them uh, go through lot of discussions to see if there is indeed something that we can work on and then work on those issues so ma'am do you only consider the uh, lower income groups for such kind of work or general population uh, yeah that's again a good question we only work we we want we are a social like we are a non profit so are, we really want to work for the people who are economically disadvantaged or like in in some way or the other disadvantaged so low low resource or uh, yeah 
so we do work with uh, only those people for for now um any anyone one question um ma'am and last question wait, wait, wait. someone who's not asked before <laughs> indu do you have a question okay okay anyone else other than other other then okay raji go ahead um ma'am um uh, uh... one basic question actually can this idea of cash transfer uh, thing be implemented to um, have beggars free nation kind of idea i we will have to design an experiment test it and see what it says i can't tell you that it will work but i think it's with uh, it's worth trying yeah good good so um, you know if you guys are interested in talking to mukta further i'll you know i'll give you her contact details and you can talk to her separately if is there more interest but mukta before we finish a few few uh, random the uh, rapid answer questions okay ready okay oh okay okay hey one more thing before um, before uh, you guys go another thing that mukta does uh, i haven't read many of them uh, but she writes travel logs of her travel in marathi she writes a lot of travel travel descriptions when she goes right right mukta no you written you written from youtube you shown me one at least uh, yeah which one i don't remember i write but not travel log you yeah. may have definitely you read something you but you read travel log you read travel logs and you ha ah, correct read travel log yeah. but i do it correct right you mixed up okay <laughs> Okay. No, if they ask for it, I wouldn't have it. So I should be honest. Uh, I, I I mixed up the two things. I you read travel logs and you also write a little bit. Yeah. So I combined the two. <laughs> anyway, so which country do you like? Did have you liked the best so far that you've worked in? Mm, uh, Philippines. Philippines. Um, what is the strangest experience you've had? so when we were in india once we were collecting data in a uh, uh, in a rural village in ethiopia and once uh, uh like what is it called hawalda right like he came running after us <laughs> and i had luckily nobody in my research team like uh, we all were okay but he started bringing a lathi and uh, he, he was really mad that we were doing this work luckily i had my world bank id so he let us go oh, oh. what's sort of been the best so related to this what's been your best um, moments in your career uh best moment in my career is as a mother i just feel that uh sometimes um, i don't know many of you are young and probably don't even have kids uh, but i just feel that sometimes i wonder uh, for a mother it is always hard uh, to make like you it is it always is hard to juggle work and um, kids right and then this question of whether i would be a better mother if i leave my job comes in and i just feel that i actually am a better mother because of my job because i get to share with my kids what i learn and then i give them different types of experiences which i myself wouldn't get if i was not working in this field so so that is the highlight of my career hmm. um what um a, a, a person in india in general that you admire you know somebody who's done good works any anyone that you admire from india i think uh, ilabha ilabha ilabhat who started microfinance in india with seva in gujarat mm. so i think amazing work that actually inspired me also and and internationally internationally i really appreciate nelson mandela mm -hmm. okay uh, then uh, any any mentor advice that you've got that is you feel like that sticks with you the uh, any uh more than advice i just think one of the lessons i probably just 
by chance it happened to me but i would just say it because i think it's important i think it, you should always follow what your mind or heart tells you to do as your career versus what others are telling is the best Excellent. for you excellent no i i it's such, such a good way to so sort of end in this in this presentation but my last question is uh, from from a uh, as you interview people for your for roles in your company or you've interviewed in other places in your companies etc what are the qualities that a person should have when 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 they when you want to hire somebody what are you looking for obviously the technical knowledge is there but in addition to that what are you looking for in a person i really feel that passion is important um and that comes when you are talking to people and i think another thing is problem solving attitude and like really being positive and taking up challenges because i we really i really feel in my field i feel it's really very hard to uh, do the work but it's uh, like i really feel that what keeps us going is that we believe that this is really good and we can make an impact so um i yeah so that's what i would say um passion uh as i said problem solving attitude and then just you know enjoying what they get to do because when you enjoy you are able to put more without complaining and that shows in your work also great okay uh so thank you so much mukta and uh, it has been a pleasure talking to you uh, it's an hour and 15 there we've recorded this and we'll send it to you and all of everyone else <laughs> a network should last a lifetime let us help you create lasting professional relationships with our world class mentors through the biopatrika industry mentorship program a strategic guidance program unlike no other full of expert interviews industry internship opportunities cv writing inflection point analysis life maps and of course the gateway to your dream career for a limited time only All our services are freely available for you as we truly want you to succeed.